enjoyed being burned for 15 students for the last three years, watching them uh, work their way through. I think I didn't get that blood. Blood, sweat, and tears. Um, I turned out a couple of Spanish fingers doing the things you want to see. Um, they've accomplished a heck of a lot. They've done some really good science. They learn about each other. We won't elaborate on that. Um, but any group dynamic, you know how important that is to, to be able to work with a group. That's a wonderful thing. We really do appreciate the families being here, moms, dads, aunts, cousins. <laughs>
each year. It's actually so fluid to the point that it's deemed unsafe to swim in. So to summarize the issues, there is excess stormwater runoff due to impervious surfaces. Besides roadways and sidewalks, the roofs of residential homes have impervious surfaces that contribute to runoff. So what exactly can we do about this? We have a solution. Green roofs. A green roof is essentially a roof of a building that is covered with vegetation and growing medium for the vegetation, which is also called substrate. Green roofs are traditionally and primarily implemented on flat roofs and have the capacity to reduce stormwater runoff by retaining this water to be used by the plants instead of having it just run off the roofs. There are some issues with green roof the green roof solution, though. There is a severe lack of green roof systems for sloped roofs. The sloping load limitations of residential roofs prohibit the use of commercially available green roof products unless major renovations are made. And this is a gap that So Green wishes to fill. To combat this problem, Team SoGreen sought to develop green roof retrofits for sloped roofs, which are green roof systems built on platforms that can be placed on top of existing roofs after the shingles are removed without building an entirely new roof. We believed that we would be able to design a retrofit with a 10 pounds per square foot dead load, which is the weight of the green roof, green roof system with plants and substrate. With these retrofits, we wanted to find the best design, meaning the most lightweight design with the most effective water retention rate. We also sought to gauge the general appeal of implementing green roof technology on sloped roofs among Maryland homeowners to gauge the marketability of this product. Our research is broken up into two sections, developing and testing our modules and conducting our focus groups. I will begin by explaining the module portion of our research, which is broken down into three steps, building, data collection, and implementation of the irrigation system. Let's start with step one, which is comprised of selecting our roof angles, roof layers, substrate, and plants. We used four different modules, each with different roof angles, as you can see in this picture. We had our two degree acting as the control because this is a typical angle used for flat green roofs. The 15 degree slope was used to simulate rancher style houses, and the 30 and 40 degree slopes were used to simulate two story homes with average roof grades between these two values. For our green roof module, we have seven different layers. In the next few slides, I will be explaining each of these layers in greater depth, but to give you an overall picture, going from top to bottom, we have a layer for plants, a load support grid, or LSG, and substrate, a filter fabric layer, rock wool, a drainage layer, EPDM, waterproofing membrane, and lastly, the plywood, which I would like to clarify is part of the existing roof after shingles are removed. So as I stated before, the top layer is comprised of plants. The second layer is comprised of the load support grid and substrate. The LSG was used to prevent substrate particles from sliding to the bottom of the platform. And within each cell of the LSG, we had at least we had two inches of substrate and at least one plant. Beneath the load support grid, we had a filter fabric, and this is a picture of a typical green roof filter fabric. This layer is used to prevent fine substrate particles from passing through to the drainage layer. Below the filter fabric was our rock wool. Here's a picture of the rock wool that we used. Rock wool is a fiberglass material very similar to insulation that retains water and slowly releases it, delaying the peak flow rate of runoff. Below the rock wool, we had a drainage layer. Here's a picture of a typical green roof drainage layer. The purpose of this is to allow water to flow to the bottom of the module and prevent it from cooling in the system. Below the drainage layer, we had an EPDM waterproofing membrane. EPDM stands for ethylene propylene diene monomer, but for those of you who are confused, think of it as a thick piece of black rubber. Here's a picture of the EPDM that we used. We glued this directly to the plywood layer to prevent water from escaping the system and damaging the wood. In the next part of phase one, we selected our substrate. Substrate is important because it affects the green roof weight, retention of water, and facilitation of plant growth. We based the selection on four different factors and wanted a lightweight substrate with a high granulometric distribution, which is this particle size distribution that was also durable and capable of facilitating plant growth. We decided to initially test a substrate mix containing brimstone, which is a material made of recycled glass because it was commercialized to be a good lightweight substitute. We conducted three different tests using this brimstone mix, which included a particle distribution test to test the uh, granulometric distribution, a 30-day freeze-thaw test to test the durability, and a plant growth facilitation test. 
The, the growstone passed the first two tests, but we later found that the growstone contained high levels of sodium, which ended up damaging our plants, making it a terrible substrate. We ended up selecting a substrate containing M2, which is a heat expanded shale, and M2 is commonly used in the green roof industry and has been found to be successful, although not as lightweight as growstone. We also use green pumice, which is absorbent and can retain large amounts of water while still remaining lightweight, and we also use a small amount of organic matter which is used to provide plants with nutrients. In the last part of phase one, we selected our plants. Plants are an integral aspect of green roof systems because having a healthy and attractive vegetation layer is desirable. We selected sedum plants because they are self-sustaining, requiring very little maintenance, grow rapidly, and have a high ground cover density. The team used six different types of plants, all of them thriving in the mid-Atlantic region, and we decided to use a variety because research has shown that certain plants function differently by season and colonize on different parts of the roof at different times. The team used six different plant types of plants, which were Stephen's Conchaticum, Album, Saxangular, Reflexum, Hybridum, and Spurium. And just as a note, Stephen Conchaticum was recently recategorized under a different genus called Phenomus. Here's a picture of our completed modules right after building. This in particular is our 15 degree one. This concludes step one of the module section. Next, Ben will discuss steps two and three. Thank you, Connie. Uh, this was one of four modules that formed the basis of our data collection and analysis, which was our second step. We only had enough resources to construct four modules, one in each slope, but they were effective at capturing data. For our data collection step, we took multiple measurements, when each rain event occurred, how much rain came down for each event, how moist the platforms were, how much runoff leached from them, how heavy was the design, and how much did it cost. Plus, we took into account focus group reactions to our retrofit design. We also had some general parameters for our data collection. It was collected over the course of six months, and all data was grouped according to rain event. Constraints on our analysis included the randomness of rain events and weather patterns characteristic of the mid-Atlantic climate. When we were collecting data, we saw the need to group rain events into categories. The two main categories were storm size and storm intensity. Storm size is the total amount of rain recorded over the course of an entire event, while storm intensity is the rate at which rain fell. For both storm size and intensity, we had three categories which we found from greater literature. Small, medium, and large for size, and low, mid, and high for intensity. One such measurement affected by different storm classifications was volumetric water content, or VWC. In essence, this is a measurement of how saturated a material is. We had four probes located in the rock wall layer of each platform, and you can see in the image the placement of the probes in the 45 degree module. Probe one at the bottom, all the way up to probe four at the highest point of the module. This was true for all four platforms. The different probe placements showed how slow affected VWC. This effect is apparent in the graph above. It shows the average value of VWC for probe three during one hour, six hours, and 12 hours after a high intensity rain event. The y-axis displays saturation in percent where one is 100%, and the x-axis is time after a storm. The top line in blue displays data for our control module, which you can see is visibly much more saturated than the other three lines for our 15, 30, and 45 degree modules. This was true for all modules at all ports, and not only true for all intensities of storms, but all storm sizes as well. And this is important because it shows the slope roof. Um, all of our slope modules have much lower VWC values than our control. We also noted in our analysis that probe four in every module had a much lower VWC than probe one and much higher. Basically, the higher you move on the roof, the drier it gets. Even though VWC was positive in our graphs, which demonstrated our module's absorbent qualities, we still observed runoff. Determining the time from the start of the storm to the first recorded water leaching out of the modules, which we define as runoff delay, was an important calculation to our project because our goal was to mitigate or delay peak stormwater runoff. Here, we've displayed our runoff delay averages in two tables, according to storm size and intensity. 
In the first table, we see that the difference between the runoff delay for small and medium storms, storms is about a factor of two. However, delay varies a little from slope to slope, looking across from control 15, 30, to 45. In the second table, the runoff delay is dramatically shorter for high intensity storms than low and mid. Again, delay varies a little across slopes. These tables are important because they reveal a trend that implies a little difference between runoff delay and module angle, showing that all retrofits behave similarly under the same weather conditions. The main takeaway is that slope roofs can delay peak stormwater runoff. Next, we can analyze the relationship between storm categories and runoff delay for each module to see if there is any correlation. For those of you unfamiliar with what correlation is, any values closer to one is indicative of a strong correlation, and any values closer to zero are a weak correlation. We saw a moderately strong correlation between intensity and runoff delay in the upper row, and a weak correlation between size and runoff delay, as you see in the lower row. This makes sense because intense rain will cause immediate ground runoff, resulting in phenomena such as flash floods. Alternately, large, slow storms will only increase runoff if the ground is already saturated, so any period of dry weather beforehand will reduce runoff in the case of rain. Despite all the runoff we reported, our modules were effective at mitigating about half of all rainfall. Looking at the table, you can see that the more sloped modules retained less water. However, the difference between the control and the 15 and 30 degree module was about 10%, still retaining over 50%. This means that if the design is implemented, a large reduction in peak stormwater runoff can be achieved. Although 50% is a good start, we wondered how we could mitigate 100% of all stormwater runoff. This is where step three of our research came into play. We designed an irrigation system for our 30 degree module, seen in this image that included large cisterns for storing stormwater runoff. Except in the cases of torrential rain, our system can hypothetically capture 100% of all rainfall. During growing seasons, the water is recirculated into the green roof to combat low BWC values that accompany slope green roof systems, as we noted earlier. This promotes evapotranspiration of the water and increases the survivability of the plants. Ideally, the system would be automatic and would store water indefinitely until sensors detected that the VWC was below a set threshold, at which point the platform or roof would be irrigated. For our testing, the irrigation system had to be switched on and off manually. It was simply a prototype. After collecting all data, we still needed to answer two important feasibility questions. First, we wanted to design a retrofit as lightweight as possible in order to be placed on an existing residential roof without any structural modifications. In the chart, we summarize our final roof weight measurements. A typical shingle roof weighs about 5 pounds per square foot, while our retrofit came in at about 10 pounds per square foot dry. In essence, there would be a net gain of 5 pounds per square foot to the roof. Our saturated weight is the weight of the green roof when completely soaked with water. Because roofs in Maryland have a minimum live load of 25 pounds per square foot for additional snowfall and ice weight, we wanted to remain well below that threshold. Our green roof weighed in at only 16 pounds per square foot while completely wet, well below the state minimum, indicating that there was still overhead for more weight, and this means that it could be put on an existing roof without modifications. The second key factor of feasibility was whether or not the design was cost effective. Looking at this chart, a typical shingle roof costs anywhere from six to ten dollars, including labor, while a traditional green roof costs in the ballpark of five to twenty dollars, depending on the system. Our design costs about ten dollars with labor included. This is only slightly more expensive than the upper end of shingle roofs, so it is indeed affordable and cost effective for consumers. Looking at the last row, we have included the cost of a cistern and irrigation system, which adds two dollars per square foot overall. To offset this cost, homeowners can actually receive up to $2,000 in government rebates for the installation of cisterns, offsetting the cost. Next, Courtney will talk about our focus groups and how potential homeowners feel about implementing a green roof. Thank you, Ben. So as Connie mentioned at the beginning, we also held a focus group component to our research to determine the marketability of a green roof retrofit design. We did this because we wanted to make sure that if we could design something successful, that it could actually be sold. 
Again, like I said, the way we did this was through holding focus groups. Our first focus group was in spring of 2013, where we gathered homeowners from PG County and Montgomery County to two sessions. The first session held seven people, and the second session was with five people for a total of 12. At the beginning of every session, we did a brief presentation to introduce the group to our research, and from there we asked several different questions to prompt conversation to get insight from the homeowners. Our overall goals for the first focus group were to gain insight on the current knowledge of homeowners on green roof systems. We wanted to know what they already knew about them. And our second goal was to see if they had any misconceptions about green roof technology. Lastly, we wanted to get their insight on what they would want to see in a green roof in order for them to implement it on their own. Our second focus group was in the fall of 2014, after about six months of our modules growing. For this focus group, we had three people in attendance. Two were back from the first focus group, and the last one was new to our research. Our goal for this, uh, for this focus group was to get the homeowners appraisal of our design. So first, we just went and showed them our modules. We asked them questions about what they liked about it, what they disliked about it. So this could inform us on the marketability of the specific design that we designed. After that, we just asked them any concerns that they still had with our design, and we asked them what could be changed so it could be more appealing to homeowners. During each focus group, we had an audio recorder, and from there we were able to transcribe the sessions and go through the recordings to figure out any common themes among the focus groups. The homeowners did have some concerns about a green roof. One of the main concerns was the cost factor. They were um, concerned that it would cost much more than an original sh shingle roof, and they were also concerned that insulation would be a big cost as well. Homeowners also were concerned that there would be maintenance involved with a green roof. They didn't want to have to climb up on their own roof to maintain it. They also didn't want to have to pay someone to do that if they couldn't do it themselves. They also brought up the fact that homeowners associations may place restrictions on this new technology, that their neighbors, could, their neighbors could perceive it in a negative way, and they also brought up the fact that it could have a potential fact, uh, impact on a resale value of a home if the potential buyer didn't want to uh, have a green roof. There were, however, several incentives for implementing green roofs as well. One was that it could increase the longevity of their existing roof. They were also excited to hear that there were any tax, break, tax breaks, rebates, and incentives for implementing sustainable technologies in general on their homes, especially ones that can mitigate stormwater runoff like a green roof. They were surprised to hear that our cost was pretty comparable to an existing roof that they would already have, and they liked the idea that a green roof could be aesthetically appealing and have some greenery to their house. They also mentioned that there would be a lot of pride in the early adoption of the new technology and that they would be doing one's part for the environment. I want to go ahead and reiterate our conclusions from our research. The first is that our modules weighted at about 9.8 pounds per square foot dry weight and 16 pounds per square foot saturated weight, which were both below our goals of 10 pounds per square foot and 25 pounds per square foot respectively. After looking at all of our data analysis, we concluded that our control module performed the best, especially in terms of volumetric water content and retention of water, and also dealing with different types of storm intensities. There was, however, no difference in runoff delay between the modules, which shows us that a sloped green roof can actually delay peak water flow, uh, as we predicted. The control module did have the most plant coverage of all four modules, Cedar Camp Shattercom was the most successful plant that grew out of the six that we originally planted. The cost for our green roof was $10 per square foot versus $8 per square foot of an existing shingle roof, which we thought was pretty comparable. And we also decided that homeowners would be willing to implement a green roof on their house, so as, uh, however, cost would be a big consideration for them, but they would also feel really great about having an environmental impact on their community. There were some limitations to our research. One was space. We only had enough space to build one module at each slope, which means we didn't have repetition. Our growing period was also very limited. This could have impacted the root systems of our plants. They weren't adequately able to establish themselves, and if they had been able to, it could have increased our water retention. We also only tested this in mid-Atlantic weather. Their results could be different in very warm climates or also very cool. We also used um, six rock wool sheets on each slope, instead of having one rock wool sheet that extended all the way up the slope. We determined that this could have had an impact in how well the water transferred from sheet to sheet as it was running off. And since our sensors were each placed in a different rock wool sheet, it could have limited our uh, data readings. 
Also, rainfall was out of our control. We were only able to use the rainfall that was given to us. And we also assumed rainfall fell straight down every single time. However, as we all know, sometimes rain comes out of a slant, which means that not all of the water would have been hitting each of the modules in the exact same way. We do have lots of future directions that SoGreen is excited to explore. One, for marketability, we would just like to talk to more homeowners. We were only able to talk to 13, and most of these people were already interested in sustainable technologies up front. We would like to hear the opinions of people, of more people like that, and also people who maybe aren't as interested up front. To do this, we would be able to explore, further explore the barriers and incentives for implementing sustainable home technologies, and research the causation between homeowners and others who want to engage in sustainable living in general. In terms of our design, there are also many future directions. One is just long-term runoff and moisture content analysis of the current existing modules. In fact, our mentor is actually going to keep our modules and use them to study survivability of plants at different slopes long-term, the effects of seasonal changes and weather on water retention, and studying the effect of storm intensity on water retention using a much larger body of data than we had. Our mentor is also going to study the irrigation control concept in much more detail to really come up with a, a marketable design for that. We can also study uh, in different climates using greener tax slopes in different climates across the country to make sure that the, the retrofit can be designed for homeowners anywhere. We want to give many thanks to everyone that made our project possible, in particular our wonderful mentor, Andrew Ritzy, and the Jefferson program. I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, and I had several notes here, and I broke it down into uh, preparation for 
focus groups and then had some questions about, uh, about the study itself. And I just wanted to commend you on uh, what I thought was an incredible um, team effort, collaborative effort uh, in the preparation. Um, of course, I had the advantage of reading in depth all the things you were also asked about just now. Um, so I was really very um, thankful for having that strong background. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the focus groups, um, which I thought was an exceptional way to go uh, in terms of uh, kind of going out on a limb, because I think of all the science that you could have been doing was uh, involved with social science, which had a lot less predictability in the results. Um, and I think as we found, uh, it actually posed some interesting questions and brought up some um, very curious uh, results, uh, especially in terms of safety and maintenance. Um, and of course, the cost, um, which is also what it came down to. A um, couple of questions I had, um, and I'm not sure if I was missing something in some of the research, but, um, and this is something that I've always asked myself in terms of uh, green moves. Um, so as plant mass increases over time, and presumably a successful green move would increase in plant mass, um, does it also increase in weight? And how does that figure into any of your Maybe not anything that you've done so far, but maybe something that you would consider uh, in terms of future research. Uh, who's going to have a weighting question? <laughs> um, you're absolutely right. The uh, weight would increase uh, as the plant populations become more dense. Because they are sedum, they stay much lower to the ground. The idea is that they would outcompete all the other plants that grow on the roof, so you wouldn't be seeing shrubs or trees or very like woody plants that weigh a significant amount on your roof. So, uh, to answer your question, I would say it would increase by maybe uh, a few pounds at that point. Uh, and the way to combat that is to play around with how much substrate and how many layers you have below that. Since we only had six months of growing time, we did not 